Antiochus III, or the Great, had many titles. King of the Seleucids, Commander-in-Chief of the Aetolian League, heir to Alexander. However, I am sure based off my knowledge of the people who watch my channel, or more accurately, don't watch my channel, that none of you know who he is, and that's fine. My goal here is to change that. The first thing we have to understand about Macedonian politics is the incest. Here's a family tree of Seleucid Persia. Yeah, it's pretty bad. The good news is that an emperor of any Macedonian kingdom, because of interfamilial relations, essentially has an infinite pool of heirs to pick from, and they will never have illegitimate kings on the throne. The bad news is that the amount of legitimate heirs can sometimes cause, shall we say, jealousy kerfuffles. Now these kerfuffles involved a lot more blood than roses, and could only occur if the empire that we're talking about is unstable. Enter Antiochus III, heir apparent to the dying Seleucid Empire, born in 242 in the province of Persia. These were the conditions of the empire upon his ascension. In the east, Bactria, or modern-day Afghanistan, had broken off under a false king, and to the north, the Median Persians had revolted and taken back much of their lands. To the south, two generals, Molon and Alexander, had revolted, and to the far west, there were Anatolian peasants who were rebelling against the king. Antiochus was, however, lied to by his advisor Hermaeus, and was then convinced to invade Ptolemaic Egypt instead of dealing with the much more pressing matter of the rebellions. Although this invasion initially failed, Antiochus still had his eye on the Nile Delta, and after quelling the Medes and eliminating the rogue Macedonian generals in Persia, he was ready to march back into Egypt. Egypt was still suffering under weak leadership and an equal amount of internal hardships, and the armies of Antiochus far outnumbered Ptolemy IV's poultry force. Plus, Egypt is, and was, a crown jewel in any empire because of the wealth its farms produced. Controlling both Mesopotamia and Egypt would essentially free up any campaigns eastwards or westwards, so he finally decided to attack in 218 BCE. The two armies converged at Raphia, in modern-day Israel, near Gaza. Antiochus, despite his genius, ultimately lost the battle. First, he pushed the Egyptian left with his right, because his Indian elephants were bigger and stronger than the African elephants on Ptolemy's left. Chaos ensued as Antiochus broke the Egyptian left, which routed and left the battlefield. It was at this point that Ptolemy ordered a cavalry encirclement on Antiochus's left flank with the Egyptian cavalry. The Egyptians encircled the Seleucid cavalry and broke their left flank. The Egyptian center now plowed through the Seleucid center with cavalry support, and Antiochus was forced to sign peace and leave Syria. In this scenario, however, Antiochus leads the left rather than the right, and while his right breaks the Egyptian left, he is able to hold his cavalry against the Egyptian onslaught. Antiochus's left holds, his right breaks the Egyptian left, and his left and center converge on the Egyptian center. Ptolemy IV is captured, and Egypt goes with him. It's about this point that I start to develop divergent theories. The schemer Hermaeus had a plan in place to assassinate Antiochus III because Hermaeus had a kid, also called Antiochus, who could have been considered a rightful heir to the empire because of his lineage. In real life, Antiochus III discovered this plot and had Hermaeus executed on the march back through Syria. But after a conquest of Egypt, the Seleucid king might trust Hermaeus too much to believe the rumors. Also, his own euphoria might make him believe castle intrigue was unnecessary, and Antiochus could die due to his own hubris. However, because Antiochus is a smart guy, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he lives through this plot as he does in real life. In Alexandria, there happened to be an incredibly important relic. The body of Alexander the Great. 
After he died, he was taken back from Babylon to Greece for his funeral, or at least he was supposed to, but on the way, his body was stolen by the Ptolemies and brought back to Egypt. The mythos that surrounded Alexander grew so large that he was revered as a god in Hellenic cults, and the idea was that anyone with sufficient power who held his body would be the rightful heir. After conquering Egypt, Antiochus would basically control 80% of the old Argead Empire, ruled by Alexander. And with Alexander's body, he could rally the remaining Macedonian kingdoms to his cause. Macedon and Thrace would pledge their allegiance, although the traitorous nature of Macedonian kings would force Antiochus to keep his guard up constantly. As for the revolting provinces, he beat the Anatolian rebels and the Bactrian usurpers in short order, even campaigning into Parthia and an Indian nation in modern Pakistan. With Egypt under his rule and the Macedonians bowing to him as Alexander's successors, in this scenario, these invasions would only be even more powerful and brutal. He would expand in all directions, taking back Bactria, seizing the Indus Valley, and even pushing the Parthians out of Hycurnia. The Parthians were nomadic and strong, so although they would be defeated and pushed out, I have no doubt they would survive and thrive in their own northward expansion. He would probably also seize Bithynia, the land directly across the Bosporus Straits from Constantinople. This would make his empire in this scenario look somewhat like this. During the year 218 BCE, an incredible occurrence was happening on the other side of the Mediterranean as well. Carthage had declared war on Rome in the Second Punic War, and Hannibal had marched over the Alps into Italy. By the time of the Battle of Raphia, he had already beaten two full armies at Trabia and Lake Trasimene, but the real shocker came at Cannae, where he killed almost 80,000 Romans in one battle. Rome was on the brink of collapse, and in real life, the Macedonian king decided to assist Hannibal against what they thought was a dying Rome. Antiochus himself declared war on Rome later in his life, but he only declared after Hannibal, who was kicked out of Carthage for losing the Punic War, convinced him that if he didn't attack Rome, he would fall to it. In this alternate history, however, even without the influence of a failed Hannibal, I can see Antiochus attacking Rome. I think he would steamroll and puppet the Greek city-states first, except Sparta, and then he would invade southern Italy and push into Sicily. He and Hannibal would force Rome into concessions, and although Rome would lose southern Italy and the Gallic coast, it might live on as a buffer state between Rome and Carthage. Hannibal would become a national hero, and essentially take on the powers of a monarch. Although Carthage was a republic, Hannibal's popularity would be so large after his victory that I really can't not see him as an emperor of a new Carthage. Even if the Carthaginian Senate did buck against his reign, he would just take them to submit to his force instead of his diplomacy. Carthage would probably annex more of inland Spain, and a resurgent Seleucid dynasty would annex territories on the eastern Adriatic. Carthage would own the western Mediterranean, and the Seleucids would own the east, and they would just sit there in perpetual alliance forever. These two states would almost definitely fight each other over a decade or two later. Antiochus and Hannibal may no longer survive, but their empires will, and their empires will have a bloody war ultimately ending in a Seleucid victory. Rome would be forced to pick a side, or have one picked for it, and although they would hate the Macedonians and the Carthaginians, their hate for the Carthaginians is far older, and they would pick the Seleucids as their ally. With the full power of Babylonia and Egypt, along with reinforcements from Greece and Rome, the Seleucids would hop from port to port on the Gallic coast in modern southern France, and this will eventually lead to a Seleucid seizure of Spain. The African front wouldn't be any different, with land forces pushing through Libya and into Carthage itself, taking it after a long-fought siege. Carthage would fall, and the Seleucids would dominate the Mediterranean, I can see them pushing into Gaul or Germania, but their military would have to reform from the phalanx to maneuver in the forests and swamps of northern Europe. 
These invasions, as well as others that the Macedonians would carry out, would probably lead to Macedonian soldiers subjugating modern France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, the Balkans, northern Sudan, northern Turkey, and parts of Western Arabia in addition to what they already controlled. The cultures of this Neo-Macedonian Empire would be more independent because the Macedonian kings in the real world did a horrendous job of cultural assimilation. The Gaelic cultures would still exist today, but this powerful Macedonian Empire would be even more brutal than Rome with rival cultures, trying and failing to wipe out Jewish, Gaelic, and Carthaginian peoples. Also, notably, America would not be discovered for a while because the Macedonians had almost no naval culture whatsoever, and it would take Macedon's reform or collapse to discover the new world. Macedon may eventually fall to barbarian invasions, and at a certain point the butterfly effect of an empire this large starts to get a little confusing, but there is no doubt that in a world where Antiochus wins the Battle of Raphia, the cultures, political, and social dynamics of the world are changed in a major way. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my prediction, and as always, enjoy.